Welcome back to W5. We've heard allegations of abuse against students at Grenville Christian College, psychological, physical, and sexual. And the victims? Teenage students in a period stretching from the 1970s through the 90s. But how could such a thing happen at a supposedly Christian private school? We're about to find out as In the Name of God continues. Here again is Victor Malarick. Outside Brockville, Ontario, Grenville Christian College is locked up, abandoned. The private school closed its doors in 2007. But troubling stories had begun to emerge about abuses suffered by students here in the 70s, 80s and 90s. Psychological, physical and sexual abuse. The students are grown up now, but they still feel the pain. I posted on Facebook this morning that I'm here to find that little girl I left here 22 years ago. Tell her it's okay. We can come home now. This is done. But it's not really done because they can't forget. And many people were too terrified to come today. You know, we, we reached out to a lot of people and they just said, I can't bear to face the memories of this. So this is a Christian school. You look at it. That's what we were told. told. So they say... Granville Concentration Camp. Mm -hmm. That's what it stood for in our time. Because that's what they did to us. They broke you down? Tried. I guess they, they succeeded. The Granville way? Well, I always knew this place was, was horrible. I told them when I was leaving, I screamed at them. I said, this is a cult and you guys are going to be exposed one day. Outwardly, it was a school affiliated with the Anglican Church. The headmaster, Charles Farnsworth, an ordained priest. Lord, hear our prayer. But he was much more than that. Farnsworth and other staff members were disciples of an American group called the Community of Jesus, based in Cape Cod in Massachusetts. U.S. media reports beginning in the 1980s described them as a cult, with communal living, dominant leaders, and extreme rituals particularly when it came to disciplining each other. As a follower, Charles Farnsworth applied the Community of Jesus teachings at Grenville on unsuspecting students. I went there in 1972 and I was there for about 32 years. Joan Childs was a teacher and administrator at the school. She was also a follower of the Community of Jesus one of Charles Farnsworth's inner circle and a spiritual leader for the staff. The community of Jesus, did it play a role in some kind of theology that Charles Farnsworth and the school followed? We as a community, the majority of us, were members of the community of Jesus. And in that sense, again, we took a vow of obedience to their leadership. So we learned their way of life and we were committed to their way of life. It became our way of life. How they lived, how we lived, went directly into how we treated the students. As believers in the Christian ways of the community of Jesus, staff like Joan Childs took retreats at the cult's headquarters in the U.S. Leadership from the sect visited Grenville. So you have a way of life with the community of Jesus. Did Charles Farnsworth go off the rails on it or did he stick to the, to the theology. He tried to incorporate it into our lives as staff and into student life, but the way they lived, they weren't a school, they weren't running a school. And so I think if he went off the rails at all, it was trying to get something to work for a private school that worked in a community. At Granville, this became so-called light sessions, where students were shamed, psychologically abused, for hours on end, with no breaks, not even to go to the bathroom. And it all came from a doctrine from the community of Jesus, where members would openly criticize each other for their sins. Tell me about light sessions. What's that about? Light sessions, that was the way we as a community lived. If I was doing something that another community member thought was not good, um, acting in a bad way, um, not acting appropriately, they could tell me that. And I was committed to doing the same thing for them. telling like them confessing your sins? Kind of, yeah. It was confessing our sins. But it was more than confessing them. It was pointing them out. And that is what we carried into the student body. 
You gave it to the students. Yes. Whether they liked it or not, or wanted it or not. I guess that would be true, yes. So you brought the students forward and said, confess your sins, or? I'm not sure we use those exact words. There were light sessions in the entire student body um, where a student that was in trouble or a group of students in trouble would be stood up in front of the rest of the student body and other students would tell them how wrong they were for what they did and the staff would tell them how wrong they were for what they did. Sounds and more like humiliation. It, it was. I don't think we saw it as that at the time, but I definitely see it as that now. So much discipline, punishment. What happened in, in those cases? Well, if a student did something, broke a rule, did something wrong, they would be put on D. That was the term that they used, which is they would be disciplined. Uh, in those cases where I believe we um, didn't do right by the kids, those disciplines could go on for a week, two weeks, three weeks. The hard part for them was the fact that they would be confronted in these light sessions um, by staff on a pretty regular basis during, during the time that they were on discipline. When you say confronted? They would be, they would be confronted. The, the staff would say, try to get them to see where they were not fitting in, where they had done something wrong. And it could get out of hand. It could get verbally abusive. It could get physically abusive at times. For students like Sheila Coons, those light sessions were like satanic torture. We're taken out of bed. We're taken down to the chapel, all of us. I guess, we, I think we are in our, our uniforms. We're sitting down there. Um, people are crying. Other people are tearful. I myself was just like hoping to God that I wasn't going to get singled out. You know how sensitive you are when you're a teenager, right? How sensitive to humiliation. Um, people are crying, as I say. Um, and uh, we waited and we waited. For Father Farnsworth. We're children, right? We're, we're kids. And um, I remember like how about an hour later, he comes in from the back. I thought like at the time, he's like a bat out of hell because his, his priestly robes are flowing behind him. And I saw his face at that moment and um, he was smiling. He was smirking and um, he was just so looking forward to this opportunity to, you know, humiliate and frighten children. This guy sounds like a sadist. He was a sadist. Dan Michelson recalls a time when he was singled out at a light session. It was um, a day-long session of uh, yelling and screaming. I was stood up and humiliated for my, you know, being, of course, a pervert, disgusting pervert, um, being self-righteous, um, egotistical kind of thing. A bedwetter. A bedwetter kind of thing. Students were crying, you know, because, you know, the amount of words and the hate was being thrown at them kind of thing, both by the staff and both by the prefects. Did that idea come from the community of Jesus? Yes. Did Charles Farnsworth hold these light sessions with the staff? We all held light sessions with each other. Light sessions were our way of life. And then it transferred to the students? Yes. That must have been really difficult for kids to hear everything that's negative about them? I think it was. I think it was, um, it was damaging. Um, to take a child out of his home and put him in a boarding situation is hard enough in itself. And then to suddenly put him in a situation where he's being told how wrong he is or how mediocre he is or... What a sinner he is? What a sinner he is. Um, I think it was very isolating, devastating, hurtful. And the staff themselves suffered demonization at the hands of the headmaster, Charles Farnsworth. As a community of Christians, we had taken a, a vow of commitment to those in authority over us. And so basically, the way we lived, if the people in charge told us to do something, we did it. So you did it, no questions asked? Basically, or if we did ask questions, that didn't necessarily go over very well. Who was leading you off the path? <laughs> well, in the beginning, 
um, when we first started to live a life of obedience to authority, we had um, six, six people in charge. And over time, it changed to one. Was that Charles Farnsworth? That was Charles Farnsworth, yes. Did he push the envelope in discipline, in punishment, with these light sessions? Did he go overboard? Yes. Yes. Did Charles Farnsworth treat the female students differently from the male? Um, he and a lot of the staff under him had an attitude that if there was something inappropriate going on between a girl and a boy, the boy was totally innocent. So the girl was labeled a whore, a Jezebel, uh, bitches in heat. Yes, those terms were used. Pretty damaging to a young girl to be called a whore or a bitch in heat or a Jezebel. I think very damaging. Was there any incidents, because we've, we've heard of people telling us this, of sexual abuse? Yes. Did anybody get held responsible or accountable? No. Next, broken beliefs. Charles Farnsworth wasn't a man of God. And searching for the truth. These people who are making the allegations liars? When W5 continues. In a moment, regrets too little, too late. If we contributed to your hurt, I am sorry. We'll be right back.